Hello, everyone, and thanks for attending the Recess X course. It's an honor to be part of the faculty here. My name is Laura Duggan. I hail out of Ottawa, Ontario, where I'm an associate professor in the anesthesia department here. Everything that I'm going to tell you in this lecture today is going to be included in the trauma edition of North American Clinics, the Emergency Medicine Clinics of North America. And it's authored by myself, along with Alani Doyle, who you will also meet in the course, Jordan Zunder, an excellent resident of ours, and Mary Hanna, who heads up our trauma service. That's going to be in 2023 next year, and Chris Hicks is heading that up. I don't have any disclosures except to say that a lot of what I'm going to include in this brief lecture is my opinion. And I don't really see a huge amount of difference in opinion or fact when they're distilled down together in terms of on the ground knowledge by the patient's bedside. So we combine our opinions over years of experience plus facts in order to provide the best of care. And so you'll see that in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own it when it's my opinion, but I'm also going to provide reasoning and evidence for what I say. In 2022, I see our next challenge in airway management as a general statement is human factors. And so I think that our biggest challenges at present isn't what VL you want to buy for your department, or even if you want to start a flexible scope skills in your department, it, it's the maintenance of those skills after you first learn them. Are you getting enough exposure that you can maintain your skills? And if so, how much exposure is that? And I don't have an answer for you because I think it varies depending on the person and your insight. Evidence-based decision-making can occur in airway management. It isn't just experiential anymore. I had a patient that once, therefore I shall do that forevermore. We have much, much more evidence now. There's many guidelines that can be confusing, but I think what we're moving towards is it's actually the people around you, not necessarily a particular guideline. Simplicity of decision-making in high-stress situations. And then finally, and I think this is the biggest thing, is the solo silo, although I said silo solo. It's the feeling, the, the tunnel vision that you start to get when you start to hear that uh, patients start to desat, you forget that there's other people that you can call upon. And as my hat is a previous emergency doc, and now as my hat is an anesthetist, it's all the same patient. The patient doesn't change their airway difficulty depending on the floor that they're on. Uh, and we need to call upon one another uh, when we're doing things that we don't normally do. And you have every reason and right to be involved in those cases and not to get pushed to one side. Uh, depending on the specialty of the other person, um, uh, we can definitely work together. And I'll show you examples of that. Airway trauma to me uh, falls very nicely into blunt versus penetrating. Penetrating tends to be the dramatic one. You can obviously see that this young woman has a gunshot wound to the neck. And in which zone is always the first question. And I don't really pay attention a lot to zones, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But she had penetrating trauma here, and an approach to that that can be very distracting from her other injuries. And she had a very significant brachial plexus injury due to where the, the gunshot wound went. As opposed to blunt trauma, mechanism of injury is exceptionally important. It's very unusual to have blunt direct airway trauma, and it's usually as a result of an assault, such as this gentleman had at a bar fight uh, about eight hours before this picture was taken. All these photos are taken with patient permission, just to, as, just to put that out there. And really, there wasn't a lot to find on physical exam. Both of them are sitting up in their position of comfort. Evaluation of any airway trauma depends on the mechanism of injury. And I put a lot of money, and this is my opinion, but I put a lot of money on whether they can lie flat or not. And both these patients could lie flat. Once I spoke with them and asked them if it was at all possible, they did not get more short of breath. Their hemodynamics did not change with lying flat. So we were able to get further imaging by way of CT scan. Unlike our gunshot wound patient, the blunt trauma that you just saw in this gentleman had pain way out of keeping with his physical findings, maybe a little subcutaneous emphysema, but he really had a hard time swallowing without pain. 
the physical exam is obvious, you may get nothing, you may get everything, it may be very obvious. Imaging, I think, is if you can at all get a CT scan, it, it really is so wonderful to get. And if not, then at least an airway x-ray at 90 degrees to one another to see what's going on. Consider doing awake techniques in direct airway trauma, whether that be blunt, which is infrequent, or penetrating, which is much more frequent. So this gentleman, I just did a recon of, of his CT scan here, and you can see he has tremendous damage to his airway. His airway has a longitudinal approximately three to four centimeters of a three millimeter airway. And I think we need to remember that a CT scan is a snapshot. So you aren't seeing his dynamic intermittent complete airway obstruction, which is what he was having by the time we brought him to the OR for a low tracheostomy between tracheal rings three and four is what we ended up doing with him. Just tremendous hematoma and obstruction. Don't get seduced into thinking that you can just maybe wiggle a flexible scope, a fiber optic scope, we now call them flexible because most of them are camera chip based, through this. It is tiger country. You will probably form a false passage and there's no question you will completely obstruct his airway with an endotracheal tube and a fiber optic bronch, and you will make him desaturate and do further damage to his airway. So this is direct laryngeal trauma. This is tiger country. This is him in the OR, and I'm just going to play the video itself, and let's see if that works. What muscle would be there? And you can hear he's keeping his, he's self-peeping to keep his airway open while a low trach is done in the semi-sitting position. The sedation that he's having for this is under local anesthesia, and the sedation he's having for this is nothing, the goose egg. So this is the way to treat these patients. So ENT obviously is extremely helpful to get involved early. I do think there's a role in ultrasound just in terms of assessing what blood vessels are over the trach lower down, but don't futz around with an ultrasound device thinking that you could maybe do ultrasound guided intubation or something like that. But don't do new things in the middle of urgent situations. After we did a low trach on him, I did sedate him and just took a look with video camera at the time it was a C-Mac. And you can see these are his vocal cords. You can see the right vocal cord, but the left is completely obstructed with hematoma and there's absolutely no way you could slip or finagle something down there without causing further trauma. Just finally, with blunt injury, mechanism plus pain, these are sports injuries. Sumo wrestlers suffer from blunt airway trauma because our jaw protects our airway. Generally, we don't get things in the neck, but we can, hockey pucks, uh, sports trauma, or uh, most commonly assault. So avoid positive pressure ventilation, insertion of any blind techniques such as a supraglottic device, Avoid endotracheal intubation if at all possible. And crikes are utterly contraindicated in laryngeal trauma because you're cutting into something that's already broken. So your picture frame that we rely upon for the cricothyroid membrane is completely smashed. So uh, all the things that we normally go to in our normal paradigms do not match uh, blunt airway trauma. Uh, so I'm very glad that it's infrequent. Penetrating neck trauma is a different beast altogether. We see this actually much more commonly, and whether that be from stab wounds or gunshot wounds or any sort of particulate matter coming at somebody from trauma, and we've classically indicated the zones of the neck. To me, the most important zone of the neck is, is zone three. That is an unusual finding to find a zone three injury, but it has a 50% mortality. And in the two patients over 20 years that I've seen with a zone three injury, one of them died and one of them lived. So 
maybe the confidence interval is quite large for two patients, but nonetheless, this is an injury that can go into IJ and it can go into the carotid as well. And so the common carotid and you can completely stroke out a patient with this. So look out for zone three injury. Zone two and zone one injury, much more common, but they can go anywhere. There's no, there's nothing saying that a, a, a knife or a gunshot wound needs to pay attention to these zones. So I think they're useful in terms of identifying where the entry and possible exit is of, of penetrating trauma. But aside from that, that, that's about it in my opinion. So there is times where, where these types of injuries can be neatly defined. And, and this gentleman that you see at the 10 o'clock position actually had, this was a workplace injury. He had said good morning to a friend of his who was using a powered nail gun and he uh, completely nailed his uh, trachea. Um, and the gunshot wound you've seen already, and my apologies, I, I screwed up my slide a little bit, but it's not the end of the world. There is times, and this was a result of an assault that you see in the six o'clock position, that airway management becomes very obvious when somebody has a terrible penetrating wound. And this was an assault where this woman was almost killed due to a domestic assault. And intubating her was actually very straightforward in the emergency room. And we brought her up for a low trach so we could repair what injury was done. But there is times where this, where this ends up being an easy thing, a quote unquote, to sort out in the initial response to resuscitation. This is the thing that, I, that was on my previous slide that I just wanted to draw out, which is, I think, in my opinion, because penetrating injury does not respect the zones of the neck, that you need to look both above and below the glottic entry. So you need to look above, if you're gonna intubate these patients, you need to be able to see the glottic entry, meaning that you wanna see the vocal cords, the arachnoids, everything else, but you also wanna be able to look below. And so for that, you need a flexible scope. But for those of you who have intubated people with a flexible scope on its own, you know that there is a point where you're actually in the trachea and you blindly push down the endotracheal tube, you can twist it, ask the patient to take a breath in, but it is a blind technique essentially. And it's during that, particularly if penetrating trauma has, has actually injured the airway, that you can create a false passage and further damage. So we do have the technology now that we can look above and below the airway simultaneously. And this is actually a video that, that I took, again, with patient's permission. This gentleman was an assault victim who had penetrating knife trauma above and below the airway. And this is actually now 10 years ago. And you can see there's blood in the airway. Blood is not a contraindication to a video scope most of the time, by far and away most of the time. These screens are put above and below one another, both people managing the airway. So there's two people, video laryngoscopist on the left, fiber optic person on the right, and we both go in together so we can see above and below the cord simultaneously. Penetrating neck trauma, this way we aren't creating false passage. We can see exactly where we're going, making sure that we stay in the airway itself. And then the next stage of this particular procedure is actually being able to see the endotracheal tube go in through the glottis and confirm that it's in the trachea using the flexible scope itself and above the carina. So we can measure it above the carina, we can see it go through the larynx. And this to me is the safest process, whether you're doing this awake, which you can, or asleep, post-induction for patients. So penetrating zones only, uh, in conclusion, zones only define the entry. There can be other traumas, there can be other zones, and identifying the exit wound, if there is one, is very helpful. I think visualizing above and below the glottis is actually standard of care. And in my experience of managing these patients, having a video laryngoscopist and a flexible scope person managing the airway together actually forms a very nice relationship between anesthesia and emergency medicine when that's required. So we become buds because we're managing it together and it's not arm wrestling for the airway. 
the it's very powerful. The VL can actually retract tissues, whereas a flexible scope can go around tissues. So each addresses the weakness of the other. Very powerful indeed. And we can do this awake when required. And in fact, the assault patient that you just saw was indeed done awake. And then finally, I just want to touch back at skills maintenance. Now, it's great to say we should be combining VL and a flex scope. But consider how you will maintain these skills. And so, for example, the next time that you need to intubate a patient, why not set up a VL and a flex scope together? Flexible scopes can be either disposable, about 300 Canadian dollars, or reusable, a lot more expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. But some people will not open a flex scope because of that $300 value. But my argument would be, when are you going to learn it? Are you going to learn it when you absolutely need it? You should learn it now, and we need to be using these more often. Get an anesthetist, your anesthetist colleague, to come down and coach you on how to do this together. Come up to the or across to the OR and join us for a day, just repeatedly doing the same thing and asking about equipment and, and working on things together. I would encourage you to start using nasopharyngoscopy for neck trauma to assess neck trauma and direct airway trauma. This is also a way of being able to repeatedly visualize the airway in different ways and getting more comfortable with flex scopes, getting more comfortable with topicalization. And again, very much emphasize calling for others. Do not be a solo practitioner, especially in semi-stable conditions so that when you get that unstable patient, calling for people to come down and help and how to help becomes much more of a sort of standard procedure as opposed to something unusual. Thanks very much. Thank you.